So uh, I thought before I start talking about lemon tree and what we've done there, I'd give you a small background to the way our thinking evolved and progressed. So it's really a, a small history lesson that I'll start with. But before that, let me start by something personal. I've always been fascinated at how asymmetry, which is inequality in some form or the other, and this is normally asymmetry in access to resources or to talent or uh, to capital, has affected the life and fate of countries, of companies, and of individuals. There are two types of asymmetry, planned and accidental. A classic example of accidental asymmetry is the presence of oil in the Middle East, how it changed the life and fortunes of the countries there. Planned asymmetry is when a company, for example, like Apple, which was nearly bankrupt 20 years ago, planned to introduce the iPod, the iPad, the iPhone, and, and today is the most valuable company in, in the world. Uh, if you look at India from the lens of asymmetry, there have been two major incidents in our history in the past few hundred years which has changed the fortunes of our country. If you look at uh, India's GDP, for example, 500 years ago, India was like the America of today. 25% of world GDP was uh, India's share. In fact, India and China, between the two of them, were 50% of the world's wealth. By 1820, India was 16% of world GDP, and at the time of independence, it was 4%. So what was this huge drop in GDP share that occurred in India? Why did it happen? It was simply because the British, our colonial rulers, decided that they wanted to keep India pacified as a barely literate agrarian economy, and therefore ensured India did not go through the Industrial Revolution. At the time of independence, when our GDP share was 4%, we became uh, an independent country. We had our first set of local leaders and they had a deliberate asymmetry and focus on uh, socialism, on the planned economy, on the public sector. As a result, we missed out on the technological revolution in the West and the manufacturing revolution in the East. And today our share is less than 3%. This has led to many of India's problems. And in fact, our the way lemon tree uh, uh, came about is directly linked in some very small way to these issues. If I look today at India and, and as it is, there are some basic themes that apply. Uh, I recollect that one of the most interesting statistics that, that affected me very much when I first learned about it was that 55% of India's population lives of agriculture and that accounts for only 13% of our GDP, which means that half of India's population lives one-seventh as wealthy as the other half, and that's the agricultural part. Okay, and obviously they go through this enormous income disparity, which has led to a lot of asymmetry in their lives and in their access to resources. The second interesting statistic which I remember is that if you cut India in half from north to south, from Srinagar to Kanyakumari, then the left half of India, the western part of India, is four times wealthier than the eastern part. Again, leading to a lot of disparity. If you look at India demographically, half of India's population is under 27, and about 200 million Indians, out of the 600 million who are under 27, suffer from a huge amount of opportunity deprivation. What do I mean by opportunity deprivation? It means that they were victims of the ovarian lottery. They were born in the wrong place, at the wrong time, under the wrong circumstances. And you know, one million of these kids are entering the workforce every month and have no access to jobs or opportunity. So out of these 200 million, and I'm going to now link it directly to Lemon Tree, in these 200 million, there are about, you know, uh, I was part, I, I'm going to uh, diverge for a moment, I was, in 2011, we had received the, uh, the Shell Helen Keller Award for our work on uh, employing people with disabilities. And I was with uh, Javed Abedi, who is the honorary director of the National Council for Promotion of Employment for Disabled People. And Mr. Chidambaram, who was then the Home Minister, was the chief guest. So we asked him as to why there was no information available in, in India on disability. So he promised to put it in the census. 
And the first census that came out with disability information tells us that there are about 27 million people with disability in India, which sounds like a ridiculous number because globally about 8 to 10 percent of the population is disabled in some form or the other. That's what the UN will tell you, that's what the WHO will tell you, but in India the numbers are only 2 percent. So there is something wrong in the way I think in our country we still look at disability. Maybe in the rural areas where there is high income disparity, high general inequity, people don't want to admit that they have disabled people in their families. So therefore in India the the numbers are only 2% of the population. But my estimate is that there are 70 to 100 million people with disability in India, and the severely disabled are perhaps 25 to 30 million. These people are generally not employed. The second very interesting uh, statistic that we looked at in Lemon Tree was that there are about 70 million Indian youth who have very, very low literacy levels who are disabled due to economic, social, geographic, or educational reasons. So put together, in Lemon Tree, we call them opportunity-deprived Indians. It comprises about 10% of India's population, and our philosophy is very simple. We, sim we just want to employ as many of them as is possible. How do we do this? So if I go through the Lemon Tree story, in, the company was founded by me in 2002. In 2007, Quite by accident, I told uh, my human resource people to hire two speech and hearing impaired youngsters as kitchen stewards. You have to understand, I knew nothing about speech and hearing impaired, how the disability works. I knew nothing about the disability space. And because I didn't know anything, I told them, I told my HR people to put them in the kitchen stewarding department, which is the most back of the house and most menial job in a hotel. What it essentially means is you stand in front of a washing machine and you basically stand for eight hours and just wash dishes, crockery, cutlery, and so on. So it's, it's really a horrible job. Two months passed, and one day a lady came into my office. She was very well-dressed. She came with a huge bouquet of flowers, and when she came into my office, she burst into tears. She gave me this invitation card for her son's marriage, which was a very contradictory set of emotions which uh, she displayed. And it turned out that her son was one of those two boys we had hired as kitchen stewards a few months ago. And she told me that the only reason he was able to get married, maybe she was being dramatic, was that he had a steady job, which most of his friends who were similarly speech and hearing impaired were unable to, to get. So as you can imagine, it was enormously inspirational for us. And when she left, I called my colleagues in the human resource department and I said that in four years, that is by 2011, I wanted 100 employees with disabilities in our company. So we managed to achieve that. And thank you. So in 2011, we set a new target. We said by 2015, we wanted 400 employees with disability and uh, another 400 opportunity-deprived Indians, which are the other Indians who are impaired, not physically or mentally, but due to economic or educational circumstances. So today I'm very happy to tell you we have these 800 employees working with us. And, and our target is that by 2020, when our workforce will be about 10,000 people, 40% of the company, which is 4,000 people, should be opportunity-deprived and uh, 2,000 of them will be people with disability. Incidentally, along the way, we've also designed a hotel which will get operational next year in 2016. It's the first hotel of its kind in the world. Uh, it is going to be 100% run by people with disability. It will open in Gurgaon. So what are the key learnings that we've had and the key interventions that we needed to make for including people with disability and people who were practically illiterate into our system. If I look back on it, there have been four key interventions. As far as people with disability go, we've looked at every job role in the company, and we've asked ourselves whether an entire job role or even a part of a job can be disaggregated such that a disabled person, a person with disability working there, the disability is irrelevant. So we've identified about 30 positions like this. Depending on the 
disability type and the level of disability, we've been able to hire all kinds of people. Today we have about 350 speech and hearing impaired employees in our company. We have about 30 orthopedically impaired people. We have about 10 or 12 uh, visually impaired. We have 15 people with Down syndrome. We have two people who are autistic. So we have, we have started operating across a very large spectrum of disability. The second key intervention which we made was that when we hired opportunity deprived Indians, which are Indians who are economically, socially, or educationally impaired, in fact, they are all educationally impaired, we realized we had to lower the barriers, the educational barriers to hiring them. So as an example, in 2006, we used to take only college graduates. By 2010, it had become 10 standard pass. In 2015, today, we take people who are third standard pass. In fact, I think we're the only hotel company that does this. And our ambition is that by 2020, we will take people who may have had zero formal education, okay? Um, all it required was a mindset change. It required us to realize that low literacy or illiteracy does not translate to low functional skills. The, the third intervention which was key is we realized very early on, you know, when we set the target of 100 employees with disabilities, that this could not be a charitable endeavor. So every single employee is a full-time, you know, 100% performing employee, and our entire attitude has always been that from day one, okay? There's no charity in anything that we do. It's a hard business decision. The fourth point was that initially our staff strongly resisted these new categories of people, okay? They didn't understand. Some of them were inadvertently rude. Uh, we had to completely sensitize the organization this required one-on-ones, this required town halls, this required continuous uh, communication, and a very strange thing happened. The very same staff who initially resisted uh, these opportunity-deprived Indians from working in Lemon Tree are today our strongest supporters because what they recognize, I think, and what most Indians recognize is that there is a lot of disparity in our country. And as individuals, we feel helpless about it. But if they see that an organization which they are part of is contributing towards it, and therefore they are contributing towards it, over time they become the strongest adherents for it, okay? So employee sensitization has happened. They are now very strongly aligned with it. The last is we've had to completely redo our learning and development, our training modules. So for example, all our audiovisual modules in our company have picture in picture with, uh, uh, with uh, Indian Sign Language. Explaining, explaining the task, and we've gone across the entire spectrum again of training where we have ensured that in all possible ways, um, all categories of disabilities in the roles that have been identified for them, there are training modules that make it easy for them to, to, be, to, to be effective. Now, it's been a very exciting journey for us. Uh, but the law of unintended consequences is there have been a lot of very discernible upsides for our company in this. First is, as I said earlier, as far as our guests, our, our staff are concerned, they are completely aligned, they are completely engaged, they are completely motivated. In fact, we won in the last four years, every year we've been selected as a great place to work by the Great Place to Work Institute. Uh, this year we were in the top 30. And the Great Place to Work Institute informs me that the most common refrain of employees when they were asked, about 2,500 employees participated in the survey from our company, was that they were proud to work for a company that did work with disabled people. So this has led to higher engagement. This has led to higher productivity and lower attrition. I'll give you an example that in the Indian hotel space, average attrition every year is 40%. But in our space, in Lemon Tree, especially with opportunity-deprived Indians, it is 15, okay? So it has had a strong economic benefit for the organization. The second aspect is guests. Guests, like employees, are seeing what we are doing and they're really loving it. So if you go to any social media uh, or you go to TripAdvisor or you go to guest feedback areas where, you know, we are directly affected, it's very clear that guests are supporting us with their loyalty. As a company, we get the highest return guest uh, percentage in India, over 40% of our guests come back to us. And uh, 
I, th I can say very honestly that this is, again, largely due to our work with the disabled. Last is, of course, society. Local communities where we have our hotels, since we hire staff from them typically, are very strongly engaged with us. NGOs work with us very closely. And even the government has recognized our efforts. In 2011 and 2012, we won the national award. We got it from the President of India for role model and best employer of people with disability. So uh, all in all, it's been a very rewarding journey. And you know, uh, I wanted to share this with you when Feroz invited me. He told me clearly to, to tell you our journey, which I've tried to do. And it all started, funnily enough, or ironically enough, with a wedding invitation in 2007. Thank you.